Well, good morning, folks. I'm Maria Bowie, and we thank you for joining us this morning for our extension webinar on sport, fawn, sport fish pond management. Um, this morning, we have Stephen Patrick, who serves as the County Extension Coordinator and Ag and Natural Resources Agent in Habersham County. Stephen is a fisheries biologist and has been making pond management recommendations for landowners since 1994. His current research efforts include investigating genetic introgression in the native black bass in the upper Chattahoochee River in Northeast Georgia. He's also the coordinator of the Southeastern Youth Kayaking, Youth Kayak Fishing, which is a platform for youth and collegiate anglers to compete. Please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box as you think of them, and we'll review those with Stephen at the end of the webinar. And we also would like to thank Amanda Tedrow, our Northeast District A&R Program Development Coordinator, for helping us identify Stephen as our speaker this morning. And with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Alrighty. Let's see if we can get these slides moving. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope y'all are excited and, and ready to learn a little bit about pond management. I guess the, the premise for me getting into this was a, a little boy, just like you see Drew Eason here, holding that first really nice fish at the pond side. And, Something that really got me excited about the outdoors was fishing in small ponds with my, my dad and, and grandmother and uh, really want to pass that on to future generations. And I hope this information helps answer some questions for you. I know we've got a lot of, of DNR personnel on here as well that can, that can definitely answer some of those questions for us. But uh, we've got a lot of fun ahead. First thing we want to think about in Georgia is that there's you know very very few natural lakes. Most of these ponds that we have were built you know in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to control sediment, usually for irrigation, for livestock watering, and and that leaves them in a time frame where they could be 40 to 50 years old and in need of renovation. So we've got to give some thoughts about you know how to do that. When we think about these ponds, you know a lot of times when folks call me, they'll they'll reference the pond being spring fed you know, as if that, that spring is gonna bring ideal water quality. And the thing that we've got to think about is most of our ponds are fed by groundwater, by runoff, and, and it may be a spring, but you know, the quality of the watershed around that pond is really what's gonna dictate the, the water quality therein and the management moving forward. Our fish production, we always need to remember is based on surface acres because it's tied to sunlight penetration. It's not you know, the overall depth of the water volume passing through the pond that gives you the productivity. But like we said, the watershed that's feeding it and the sunlight, how deep it penetrates into the water for that primary productivity. And that really goes into you know, every pond has a natural level of productivity and a set carrying capacity. And most of the folks that give me calls are just usually trying too hard when they're having problems. They're stocking too many fish, feeding too heavily, and just doing things that are really causing themselves you know, problems while costing themselves money. So that's, that's another premise behind today is to hopefully save you time and money. The last point we'll cover a few times is that ponds really don't require you know, periodic restocking or annual restocking. You know, the, the fundamentals are there to, to have a self-sustaining pond, and we'll talk about how to stock and manage that pond as we go. First thing we want to jump in and think about thinking about some of these older ponds is that the, you know, some of those engineering structures are, are a lot of times in older ponds, the standpipe that you see on the top picture. Uh, there's different forms of trash racks or covers. You, know, you can see the trash rack there in the, the left picture. It's going to screen out and pull water from the bottom, whereas the one on the right is pulling water from the surface. You know, the surface draw is going to remove a lot of productivity from the pond, but the main point of the trash rack is to prevent that drain pipe from getting clogged. On the siphon drain system on the picture below is a, another way to set up that pond drain that you can install now if you've got a failing standpipe system. You know, been to a couple of those in the last few weeks where it's a lot more cost efficient to put in that siphon drain where you maintain the integrity of the original dam and, and keep things moving in the event of a renovation situation. And the picture on the bottom right is one of a dry hydrant. And that's something where a lot of folks live in rural areas. If you can install one of these, you see the PVC piping is very simple, very inexpensive for what you'll gain. And if you can put in a structure like this and get it certified by the fire department that they'll use it and they know that it's there, you can help lower your, your insurance and your neighbor's insurance and really possibly quite save a home 
you know, or a life if you have this water available in the event of a fire. So I encourage everybody in a rural area, especially, or if you just have a pond in general, to look into installing a dry hydrant so that our fire folks can use it if needed. If you need technical specs, you know, our NRCS folks do have some technical drawings available. You know, for example, for this standpipe system and for the uh, siphon drain system. But keep in mind, NRCS is really there to, to for the most part, support farmers and, and develop irrigation ponds and, and livestock watering ponds. They're not really into the sport fish side. So, you know, we don't want to really want to blow them up with a lot of calls and information if we can help it. You know, a lot of times they'll refer you to private engineers and, and consultants and folks like that for a true sport fish pond. One thing that we will do, you know, NRCS in my area does that. Jason McKay does a great job going out with me with visits to landowners where we go and see pond dams like this. And, and you can see on the right hand side of the picture, there's a thing called the emergency spillway. And if you're walking your dam, you should have a portion of your dam that kind of slopes down and it's, it's an open channel that allows water in the event of a flood to come over and around the side of that dam. And you see it misses the toe of the dam and gets the water back into the stream below or ditch below to where you're not compromising the integrity of that dam in a, in a severe storm event. If that drain pipe is to clog, you don't want the water going over the top of that dam. You always want to have an open emergency spillway and I can say from you know visits to ponds, probably 90% of the ponds I go to visit, that emergency spillway has grown up with brush or trees. Sometimes they have you know beaver dams or fences across them, obstructions that in the event of a bad storm, if you lose that emergency spillway's capacity and the water starts spilling over the crest of the dam, you're going to lose that dam. And that's a, a big investment that you need to protect. So always remember to protect that emergency spillway. Growing up as a kid, you know, I probably fished more ponds than, than not that had cows that didn't have cows and cattle in the watershed is definitely going to increase their productivity. And having said that, you know, you may think that's a bad thing. In certain situations, it can be a positive thing where I've been to plenty of ponds where the cattlemen managed the herd appropriately, lined the pastures well, fertilized the pastures appropriately, and you had a fertilized pond that was highly productive, that didn't have water quality issues. It was a great win-win. And uh, I've been to other ponds where there were fish kills because there's just too many cattle in the pasture, you know, too much manure, too much things going on to where, you know, it does cause problems. So make sure you're maintaining a balance. The livestock watering ramp you see here is to keep those cows to where they can get in and get water. And then they push each other back out so that you don't have cows just loafing and standing in the pond. You know, that's not good from a, a cattle perspective because you want to keep those cows out on the grass. And, you know, the, the fencing around the pond really protects those pond banks from deterioration. It forces the cows in and out on one gravel platform, keeps the water relatively clean for drinking. And uh, like we said, it keeps them from tearing down the banks. But, you know, just because you see a cow in a pond doesn't mean it's a bad thing. But uh, there's reasons to check with your NRCS folks about potential cost share options for putting in a livestock watering ramp, you know, and, and fencing that pond out. I guess now's the time to, I, I know we've got a couple online watching this presentation and, and my boss is an Auburn grad. So a lot of this information is gonna go back to Auburn University. So it's a great time to give them, you know, a little thumbs up for all the hard work they've done. You know, uh, most of the descendants of the University of Georgia when I went there, the teachers and instructors there, you know, Dr. Dr. Shelton is online with us today and uh, Dr. Gilbert, we're Auburn graduates, disciples of Claude Boyd and, and Homer Swingle. And when you really look into all the, the recommendations for managing sport fish ponds in Georgia, most of it's going to come back to these two guys at Auburn University. So props to them. And uh, when you think about Claude Boyd, the biggest thing he's going to preach to you is about liming that pond and checking your total hardness and total alkalinity to make sure it's over 20 parts per million. Having that total hardness above 20 parts per million kind of acts like a thermostat in the pond where it's going to buffer your water quality. It's going to keep things where they need to be, and it's going to really help keep things stable for the fishes so that they can be successful. We always recommend an extension to use bulk agricultural limestone. You know, we don't really recommend hydrated lime because it doesn't last very well, very long. 
and it's kind of difficult to put out, you know, safely. So, you know, bulk agriculture alive is tedious. It is heavy. A lot of times it requires a barge like you see in the photo. And the biggest thing you want to think about with liming is you're liming the entire surface of the pond because you're liming the mud in the pond bottom to get it buffered up to a place where total hardness in the water quality exceeds 20 parts per million. Biggest thing, like we said, is covering the entire surface. If you just put it in the upper end of the pond, it's pretty well going to stay put in the upper end of the pond because, like we said, you're liming the mud in the pond bottom and not necessarily the water. So keep that in mind. What's the minimum pond depth and size to support, to support fisheries? That all goes back into, you know, what type of fishing that you're desiring. You know, you can have a, a quarter acre or a half acre pond that you're managing for trophy bluegill and just a few kids to go fishing. And uh, it can be successful. It can be something that meets your needs. You know, depth, really you shoot for anything over two to three feet to prevent weeds from taking over the pond. But remember, pond depth isn't really going to tie anything back to fish production. You know, but most ponds like that, you know, aquaculture ponds, for example, range anywhere from four to six foot deep and uh, drop off pretty quickly to that two to three foot depth starting off the edges. And uh, good question there. Thing that we're talking about with that high alkalinity or low alkalinity, the high hardness and low hardness is you can see there the fluctuation in pH, for example, is, is much lower in a pond with higher water hardness. And that goes into the fluctuations that are tied to photosynthesis and sunlight penetration in that pond on a daily basis. When the sun starts hitting the water, photosynthesis begins, the phytoplankton begin making oxygen and producing food for the bottom of the food chain. And uh, like we said, when the alkalinity or hardness is very low, that fluctuation in pH can be very drastic. And I really feel like that ties back to maybe why the fishes are more excited at certain parts of the day than others, and why ponds that are properly managed, the fishes tend to bite a little more consistently than others. You can see the dissolved oxygen has the same kind of spike, but you know a much bigger spike sometimes when that, that deal cycle is not managed appropriately with water hardness. Like we just said in the past you know, slide, photosynthesis is the key and fertilization is a way to boost that phytoplankton population. You can see on the pyramids there, you get more phytoplankton when you add fertilizer. So you're, you're making more food for the base of the food chain and you can increase your carrying capacity. But always remember, if you're not managing the total number of predators or bass in that pond, you're not really gonna create bigger bass. You're just producing more fish per acre and it's your job to get out and harvest appropriately to manage the size of those overall bass as they move along. Fertilization, like we said, is something you want to take seriously because most of the calls I get with folks having problem come from folks that aren't fertilizing properly. They're not stocking properly. You know, they're feeding too much. They're really just pushing that system incorrectly and uh, pushing the gas, you know, for the fertilizer is a great way to wind up with water quality or weed issues and uh, really not getting the results that you want. So when you think about fertilization, it depends on the productivity. You know, like we said, some of those farm ponds with cattle around them maybe didn't need to be fertilized at all and they kept a great bloom all season. Other ponds, such as up here in the mountains where the water's clear, you know, we might need 10 applications per season using that Secchi disc to determine when and how often to really get that bloom going, to get the phytoplankton started, to stimulate the base of that food chain. And uh, if you're using liquid fertilizer, you tend to use, you know, something where you can dilute that liquid and apply it, say, with a bilge pump to the prop wash and keep it suspended in the upper part of the water column. Uh, for granular fertilizer, we're using a platform, once again, to keep that fertilizer off the pond bottom and then there are water soluble products such as powders and flakes that float and stay up in suspension near the surface. And, and the point of that is, is you want that phytoplankton to grab and utilize that fertilizer and keep it in suspension. If it ever falls to the pond bottom, the clay soils in our area are going to absorb that phosphorus and make it unavailable for the phytoplankton. And therefore, you've just wasted your time and money. So uh, keep it in mind that fertilizing is, is something that you want to do. Like we said, with a pie pan or secchi disc, like you see in the picture, measuring water quality, measuring the visibility every couple of weeks to figure out, you know, how much fertilizer to apply.
Another way to boost productivity is to feed the fish. And uh, typically you want to feed a floating feed even in the wintertime. There's places in Georgia right now where the water temperatures are over 50 degrees. Floating feed makes it easy to monitor. And you want to make sure the protein content is appropriate. You know, if you're looking to, to maintain catfish, you know, you may only need, you know, 10 or 12% protein. If you're looking to put weight on hybrid striped bass or trout, you might need, you know, 48% protein. You know, the protein content is going to be something where it is going to boost fish growth, but you want to make sure, for example, I've seen some places feeding 48% trout chow to catfish and bluegill and wondering why they have water quality problems. And you say, well, all that extra protein is going to be extra nitrogen coming out in the, in the feces of the fish to where all of a sudden you've got fish waste generating a water quality and weed problem that you didn't intend for because the fish can only use so much feed and so much protein. And once you get too much of that, you're just really wasting time and money. So make sure to pair, you know, the amount of feed and the type of feed to the type of fish you're trying to grow and try to have realistic expectations. Typically we think of feeding say one to 2% of the body weight of the fishes at, you know, per day to, to really get them optimal growth. Anything over that is just wasted money and deteriorating water quality. When we talk about deteriorating water quality, you know, all that extra waste and all that extra food is going to start dropping to the bottom in that green little sludge at the bottom called the, in the hypolimnion. And if you've ever waded out in a pond in the summertime or went swimming, jumped off that dock and you hit that cold layer, that cold layer is that thermocline where, like we said before, everything in the pond is tied to sunlight penetration. So that warm, lighted, oxygenated water that's getting photosynthesis from phytoplankton in the upper part of the epilemnion is where that productivity is happening. And there's no oxygen below that thermocline. So in a farm pond in the summertime, you know, you may wade out and figure out the thermoclines at about 36 inches. And that tells you to, to keep your baits above that thermocline area because the fish just can't travel where there is no oxygen. Now, if that layer keeps getting smaller and smaller, due to over fertilization and overfeeding, eventually you might have a storm event or a cloudy day, create a situation where turnover occurs and fish kills can happen. So be very careful, you know, pushing that pond too hard. And that leads to the question of homeowners needing aeration. To me, I never like to see an aerator when I go to a homeowner's pond because it tells me they're probably pushing too hard, especially if it's running during the daytime when I pull up in the middle of the day. Aeration is typically meant for commercial aquaculture producers. Sometimes folks might use it to break the thermocline. I could agree that that may be a way to utilize it, but you know, to me, you're wasting power. You need to really focus on you know, staying within the, the carrying capacity, the natural carrying capacity of the lake, using aeration for an emergency option. And if in critical parts of the summer when water quality is deteriorating, you're looking to cut that aerator on, say, right at dark and turning it off right at sunrise, you don't want to have a situation where that aerator is running 24 hours a day because it's really not doing you any good. You really want to focus on using it as an emergency option, you know, as a crutch to help you through the tough times and not something that you rely on all the time because folks that rely on them all the time when that motor gives out and the aerator quits, Fish start dying, and there's not a lot you can do about that. The next thing I often see when I pull up at a pond with an aerator bubbling is usually that beautiful blue water. And I don't want to bash the dye products too much. I just want to let you know that when you put in a dye, you're basically replacing the phytoplankton to shade out those weeds. And by shading out the weeds with a dye that doesn't produce oxygen, that doesn't produce food for your pond, you're hurting your fish population. Uh, you're reducing the amount of oxygen that can be produced in the pond and you're limiting your productivity. So it does turn the water a pretty shade of blue, but it's eventually gonna set you up for a, a fish kill situation. It's gonna eventually lead to problems in my mind. And uh, you know that's my opinion is to stay steer clear of the pond dyes, anybody that you see using the pond dyes, I'd really ask them to do some research and figure out if there's not a better way. Jumping into more fun stuff, you know, why do we have that bass and bluegill combination? And there you see 
Auburn University pops up again. You've got an old man named Mr. Homer Swingle, who really did a great job. What type of water testing should be done for a pond? I saw a question pop up. Uh, really, I like to start with total hardness or total alkalinity. That's the real measure that I'm going to look at first. I'm going to go out and look at visually the water quality to see what it looks like. You know, you can oftentimes send pictures of the pond to your county agent and they can forward them to me if they have questions or forward them to Dr. Bertle or Dr. Shelton. Uh, testing that total hardness and alkalinity is key. You can get a basic water test run for ponds through the extension office, uh, depending on the, the shipping there. I think it's anywhere from 20 to $25 for a basic water sample. But uh, really a total hardness kit is something that you could purchase yourself or you know, just get a total hardness test done would be where I would begin. Now, looking back at, at Homer Swingle, thinking about the bass and bluegill combination, this really helps you learn about why we have the things that we have in our ponds. Homer Swingle was a depression day research scientist. He was an extension entomologist that was really interested in controlling mosquitoes to control malaria. He felt like if he could control malaria and provide supplemental food for the family farm, he was getting a win-win and -win utilizing these farm ponds that were there for irrigation, for erosion and sediment control. It was a great way to provide supplemental protein for depression day farmers. That right there tells you Homer intended for you to be keeping fish out of your pond. Now, not everybody thought that Homer was trying to grow bass like these. You know, this guy's obviously getting plenty of food and plenty of resources, but Swingle's approach was to provide satisfactory fishing. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, that we're gonna go into that in just a little bit, but Homer wanted you to have the opportunity to catch a variety of species, meaning any season of the year, different weather conditions, you should be able to catch something because remember, you're trying to feed a depression day family. He wanted you to have a variety of sizes where you wouldn't keep all the fish you caught. You could return some, you could keep others to make sure that there's always gonna be fishes there over a period of time, meaning they're self-sustaining. You know, when you stock bass and bluegill appropriately one time, they should forever be there if you manage the pond you know, appropriately. You shouldn't have to go buy fish every spring to put in your pond. And I know there's a lot of folks that buy, you know, whether it's fathead minnows or golden shiners or shad or bass and bluegill. I see so many people wasting so much money doing what they think they have to because they own a pond instead of researching what are their options to make the best use of their money. Now in the 80s, things kind of changed and we went completely away from keeping fish because folks like Ray Scott and BASS were really focused on, you know, tournament bass fishing on reservoirs, which is much different than, different than it is in ponds. And people started to pick up that catch and release ethic and returned every bass to the pond. And that resulted in a lot of ponds having 10 to 12 inch bass that just weren't very, you know, appealing to the anglers because they're used to seeing trophies getting caught on television all of a sudden. Everybody wants to be this guy holding that big, huge bass in their kayak or out on their bass boat. The expectations have been raised so much by consultants across the state and, and really just watching fishing on television. There's just so many nice fish being caught that you know folks are fishing for sport and not for harvest. And they wanna have trophy fish, not small fish. So that's most of the calls come from people that just have never fished their lake or they've restricted all harvest and they expect you to catch Really nice bass like this one. And that's where you get into harvest manipulation is the key. You know, you can't have trophy bass if they have nothing to eat. You know, quality bass need to have adequate forage, you know, bluegill preferably in my mind in that three to five and four to six inch size class. When you walk the edge of the ponds on a lot of these bass heavy lakes, you see nothing but little half inch recently hatched bluegill and that's just nothing that, you know, you can't have a fish even this size chase that kind of bait and get fat. They need something they can put their mouth on, something to fill their bellies, and a little tiny bluegill just don't cut it. So when we start electrofishing some of these lakes and, and looking at electrofishing data, you see that there's a lot of small bass, you know, a lot of those in the six to eight inch size class, a lot in the 12 to 14 inch size class, and really when you get to an 18 to 20 inch fish, that's really just a four or five pound fish. 
once those fish don't have suitable forage, they tend to die out very quickly. So it's your job to protect that forage base. And like on the same electric fishing survey, where are those three to five inch bluegill that we just talked about? They're non-existent in the pond and that leaves a situation where those bass are doing a marathon just to eat a, a little skittle. You know, they'd rather have a, a big pizza pie like Bubba Mullen used to talk about, you know, the bass pie only has so many slices. There's only so much food to go around and we've got to make sure to accommodate those fish if we expect them to grow. So stocking the pond goes back to, you know, the question earlier, what type of fishing do you desire? Who's going to be fishing? Are they going to be keeping fish and eating them? You know, what is the purpose of the pond? And everybody listening to this thing probably has a different scenario. When you look at what fish to stock, you know, bass are typically stocked at 50 per acre. You could probably go down to 25 if you needed to, as long as you protected that initial stocking. You don't need that many bass per acre. They're easy to harvest and easy to manipulate their, their numbers. So, you know, it's Swingle's top predator. Bluegill and copper nose bluegill. Notice I didn't say hybrid sunfish or anything like that. Uh, didn't mention shell crackers yet. Bluegill are your best forage fish because they spawn multiple times a year. Those three to five inch bluegill, like we said, are excellent food for those trophy bass and they provide excellent mosquito control. This is Swingle's standard forage fish, uh, stocked at 500 per acre by itself. Or if you want red ear, you can lower that to 400 and supplement with red ear sunfish. Threadfin shad are something that everybody seems to jump to. And the only thing that I would caution you against is threadfin shad and bluegill are all going to be tied back to that phytoplankton production. So the primary productivity of the pond, you can have all your forage in bluegill, all your forage in threadfin shad, I guess, but eventually they're going to have the same feed base. So don't think just adding shad is going to help altogether. It all goes back to harvesting those bass appropriately. So two to 500 per acre give you a lot of forage so that they're distracted away from the bluegill. And uh, hopefully those three to five inch bluegill start to thrive. And then consultants a lot of times get you into gizzard shad and, and golden shiners and other forage options to build that variety of sizes in the forage base. And in Georgia, we get a lot of questions about tilapia, but always remember they're legal for aquaponic situations in a greenhouse or a you know, hoop house, but they're not legal for stocking in ponds for a forage fish. Uh oh, we jumped ahead a couple. Hybrid striped bass are another option where you see, you know, fish can grow like the bottom photo from the top photo in just a couple of seasons. They're fed, you know, high protein feed, usually, you know, cost anywhere from five to six dollars a fish to get them started and, and something that's a lot of fun to have. You just need to have shad or, or trout chow to feed them to give them that high protein feed. Winter trout are something that a lot of consultants are stocking right now. Give you a great option for fishing throughout the wintertime months. I guess Travis Ingram did some trials down with Dr. Bertle where they got two to three pound trout in a season over the winter as far south as Tifton. So it's a, a lot of fun for fishing in the wintertime and it gives those bass a great thing to suck down and eat when they're coming off the bed and the trout are getting sluggish in the early summer, the bass can really pick back up off the spawn and, and really put some weight on those trophy bass. So a really great option twofold on the trout. Other options, you know, folks get into golden shiners, gizzard shad, crawfish. There's a lot of options there. And uh, I'm not against them per se. You just have to really have somebody tied into knowing the bass population there knowing that you've got a good size class that can consume those those big gizzard shad you see on the top right photo you know 14 15 inch gizzard shad is bigger than most of the bass that are in these bass heavy ponds so if you stock those adult gizzard shad in a situation where there's nothing to eat them they'll just take over and stun out and you'll have a whole bunch of forage and no bass that are able to eat them so be real careful when you're playing with forage fish that get larger than some of the bass you probably have in your pond you got to get those bass boosted up first before you take these additional options. Fathead minnows is one that I, I see a lot of folks try. Uh, typically they're stocked with the initial stocking to distract the bass from the bluegill and get them off to a good start. After about the second or third season, they'll be completely eliminated. So 
it's just for the initial pond stocking. And uh, I see so many people buying them every spring and it's just a waste of money. Grass carp are typically stocked for vegetation control. Their greatest impact is in the 12 to 24 inch stage. When they get to the one size like the picture on the right, you know, they're not doing you a lot of good. Their metabolism does slow. They're usually good for about seven years of productivity. And it's something you periodically restock and you may need to, to fish or bow fish to get these big guys out just to remove them from the system once they're not doing you a lot of good. And typically when they get that size, they start to die out anyway. And you can see there, five per acre for a preventative rate, 10 to 20 per acre for a corrective rate, depending on the weed. And we'll talk about weeds as we go later on in the presentation. Shellcracker really aren't up there with bass, bluegill, and shellcracker in my presentation because they don't provide quality forage for those bass. If you're into trophy bass, shellcracker might not be for you. If you're into trophy panfish or, you know, just want to catch big bluegill and shellcracker, by all means, you could purposely stock the pond with just, you know, red ear, for example, and the bass population is going to suffer mightily, but they're going to put enough pressure on those shellcracker to where whatever shellcracker escape predation are going to get to tremendous sizes. So if you like trophy bluegill, trophy shellcracker, by all means, you know, stock them and over, you know, overstock the bass and, and don't harvest any of those bass and you'll get to those goals pretty quickly. Catfish are one, you know, you often thought, well, bass, bluegill, and catfish, and that doesn't really occur nowadays because we realize that Swingle did recommend 50 per acre in a balanced pond, that once the bass are present, they need to be 12 inches or greater to stock them in, to grow them. And he was assuming that once they reached one to two pounds in size, you were gonna eat those fish because if you don't, you wind up with fish like this guy's holding. And uh, in this situation, there is some research out there that says once they get to about five pounds a piece and start actively growing, they become the top predator. They can eat those small bass. And I have seen situations where the whole bass population was eliminated and all there is left is, is really large catfish. And when folks go fishing, it's really difficult to catch those fish and, and doesn't leave a lot of opportunities. So if you love big catfish, you can manage for that. But if you're expecting a balanced pond or, you know, trophy bass, for example, I would tend to leave, you know, steer clear of the catfish if I could. That's where we jump into undesirable fishes. You know, we've got a, a couple of lakes up here in the mountains where the streams are feeding and, and red breast sunfish are the dominant forage fish. And it's a situation where there's not enough reproduction there to feed those bass and nobody's harvesting the bass to where if you already have low food and overcrowded bass, you really get in a bad situation in terms of balance. So be careful there with red breast. Crappy present the same problem, a predatory fish that doesn't provide much forage for the bass. Uh, in a bass heavy pond, I guess you can, you can fish the crappy hard and and keep putting the bass back and you may have large crappy and that may be what your goal is. But you know, overall, if you're looking for you know, good balanced pond, some of these undesirable fishes make it tough to keep a balance. Hybrid bluegill or Georgia giants are a cross between bluegill and green sunfish. And uh, once again, a poor forage producing, producing fish that's not gonna feed those bass you know, if your goal is large bluegill, I would contend to look at the world record for just regular bluegill and shellcracker, and you'll see that they get much larger than your Georgia Giants. Uh, some folks like to stock the Georgia Giants. That's all on you. I just don't know that I would recommend it. So putting it all together, you know, when you're looking for, you know, stocking upon, here's Swingle's recommendations. You know, the numbers we presented, harvesting the bass at year three to keep those small fish out, to, to keep things in balance, harvesting the catfish when they're big enough to eat. The trophy bluegill option, you can see you're purposely elevating the largemouth bass population and restricting all bass harvest. That leaves more forage available for the remaining bluegill. And uh, we've talked about that a few ways around. So keep that, you know, as an option, if, if you got kids, it's a, a very high catch rate type of pond and, and really good for getting kids excited about artificial lures. 
for trophy bass, you can see starting out with the fat heads to get the bluegill started, integrating the shad, fertilizing, but you've got intensive bass harvest there on the list. You've got liming to make sure water quality is there. And uh, the intensive bass harvest is really the kicker for these trophy bass situations. A lot of your consultant folks are, are pushing the Florida strain genetics. And I guess before I got into extension, I worked for a man that really firmly believed, you know, he was chief of fisheries in Alabama and really believed well into that. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint info? Yes, ma'am, they're gonna post a recording of this and I can post the, the slides on my webpage and, and send you a PowerPoint. Just send me an email. I'll have some contact information at the end. But when you think about the Florida strain genetic, it may in fact give you bigger overall potential for a trophy bass. The F1 hybrid tiger bass that is sold may very well give you genetics that produce bigger bass, but always remember it all goes back to harvest manipulation. So you can improve your genetics. You can have top quality forage, but if you're not willing to keep those fish, you know, you're not going to get any, any results from uh, that type of program. Now, how do we know what we have? You know, Homer Swingle developed the Sane Hall technique, and, and this is a chart that if you pull the Sane in the pond, like you see in the picture, creating a bag, keeping that lead line on the bottom, and, and Swingle recommended doing 20 Sane Hall pulls to determine the balance in a pond. You know, after doing this for 25, 30 years, I can literally walk the edges of the pond and look at the forage system you know, from the shoreline at the water's clear and get a great idea of what's going on. But, you know, this is a good way to, to do something inexpensive. Like we said, you're looking at the young of the year during the summertime months to look at their, you know, size distribution and relative abundance. You're looking at the species present. Uh, a lot of times you'll have to look close to make sure you're not picking up additional species. I know red breast are are kind of hard to differentiate from bluegill for some folks and red ear and little juvenile crappy. I think in this photo right there next to my fingers, there's a little baby crappy. And then all you really need is one large mouth bass to be present to document reproduction. So a uh, pretty easy technique, pretty inexpensive technique. If you're in Northeast Georgia, I've got a couple of sayings and can come visit you. If you call your county agent, we can have some fun. The next technique that folks think about is electrofishing. And electrofishing is where you're running the boat to get a sample of those fish. And uh, it's something that you can do on your own because consultants that are doing that, that electrofishing analysis are looking to get data to conduct a relative weight survey on your fishes. And relative weight is a length weight relationship in the bass to tell you how fat or how skinny a bass is at a given length. And you can see there on the chart, you know, for example, a 12 inch bass should weigh nine tenths of a pound, whereas a 20 inch bass should weigh four and a half pounds. And that gives you an idea to say, you know, a, a 10 pound bass at 100 percent relative weight, maybe around, you know, 26 inches, it looks like. Different consultants have, have put together some charts and, and uh, I guess here. Shan's got a little decal you can put on a tackle box or the side of the kayak or the side of the boat to figure out how big that bass should be because they say, well, nobody wants to do math. And uh, these are great options if you want to give them a try. Uh, doing the math, you know, here's a situation or example of a, a, a pond I used to work in Pike County with one of my 4-H'ers, Glenn. And uh, he kept watching ESPN, wanting to catch those trophy bass. And every time we went fishing, he kept catching small bass like these that were 12 inches long and weighed three quarters of a pound. Now, when we look at the chart, they're supposed to weigh nine tenths of a pound. So when you do the math, and it's very easy to do using the chart, you know, you can use the tables that are already punched out. But you can see there, his relative weight on his specific fish comes in at 83% because it's just not heavy enough to get to ideal weight. And if you sample 20 to 30 to fish from your pond, you can get a great idea of what's happening in terms of the fish population. What we can figure from that is that the pond is balanced and leaning towards being bass heavy. We want to reduce the overall number of bass early in the spring. You know, get out and catch those male bass when they're garden fry 
get the small fish out of the pond and think about fertilization and forage enhancement. But the biggest thing is getting those small bass out. Other things that consultants like to sell you on, and I'm not against it because it is a lot of fun, is a strategically placed structure, uh, usually above the thermocline layer, looking for great ambush points, looking for cover for forage fish. And uh, there have been some studies like up on Lake Burton, up where I live, where you know all the ski crowd gets out and burns every bit of brush and debris and wood that they can find when the lakes drain down. And then in the spring, there's just no cover for the forage fish, no cover for juvenile bass. So uh, structure is a great way in a pond where cover isn't very common to isolate those fish in good ambush points. And you could put flags and, and mark those spots and have a lot of fun knowing where those fish are gonna congregate. So I really do like the structure enhancement from that perspective. Other things that you might think about, especially for older ponds that have silted in or have a lot of leaf packs and mud, you know, you could think about adding gravel piles or sand flats to give good spawning areas for those bluegill. I know my mom and daddy's pond was probably 50 years old when they started managing it. And uh, the upper end had a lot of, a lot of vegetation and leaves and pine straw to where when we put in some gravel, we saw a lot of those bluegill take off and start spawning. And for us, we put the, the gravel piles right around the dock. And now, you know, even to this day, the bluegill are spawning around those areas. I know up on Lake Burton, they poured out some gravel piles on some of those public fishing docks and, and the bluegill just flocked to that, that habitat. So it's a great way to attract fish to certain parts of the pond. Thinking about renovation, if you've got a population you wanna start over with, remember you're treating puddles, not ponds. You know, this picture shows a completely dry pond and yes, you're still gonna go out and put chlorine or put rotenone to eliminate the fish, fish population. You don't want anything to survive when you're restocking a pond because you know just a couple of fish, you know, bigger than the fingerlings you're putting in, is going to mess up your balance. So you know, make sure that you know when you're thinking about renovation, you're pumping this thing down as far as possible. Fish kills like we get calls on. I know. You know, we get a lot of calls of, of fish are dying, and I don't want to sound like I don't care about fish dying because I, I, I hate to see that. But the biggest thing we've got to jump to is what is the source of the problem? Was it overfeeding, overstocking? Was it, you know, you, you fed heavy all summer and then the winter months you just shut it right off and you've got a big fish population that's dependent on you? You know, what is the issue at hand is my question because once fish start dying, really your best option is to figure out what's going to be left and how to move forward from that point once you get it stabilized. You know, whether it's a turnover situation or a disease situation, if it does happen to be disease, you, know, you could be, you know, in a situation where the fishes could accept pelleted feed. And uh, that's something that, you know, you can use Romet or Teramycin coated feed for bacterial infections and uh, move along that way, you know, with, without doing too much harm. Muddy ponds a lot of times come from, you know, either common carp or chub suckers, maybe too many catfish uh, getting in the pond and keeping it stirred up. You can see in this situation, they've got two layers of silt fence put up around this pond in this neighborhood development. And uh, doesn't mean that it did a good job protecting that pond from, from flowing in storm water. So, you know, look at the watershed, to make sure you're not causing the problem, prevent that problem by vegetating the watershed. And uh, look at the overall source of water for the pond to track down where that muddy water may be coming from. We get a lot of calls in extension about bryozoans, uh, little colonial bacterial growths that usually are stuck to sticks and twigs in the pond, sometimes the dock pilings. I know I used to pull them off the stick and throw them at Jason and Andy Rowe when we were down in Newburn fishing a pond growing up. It's actually a sign of good water quality and uh, nothing to worry about there, but we do get a lot of questions about bryozoans. Get lots of questions about turtles and wading birds. And if that pond is set up appropriately, you know, it's gonna be able to reproduce and withstand any, any consumption by these animals. Uh, you know, if it's your preference to not have them, you can contact the DNR folks and, and look into having them removed, but 
there's no science to say that they're doing any damage to the fish population. You know, I guess if you're a trophy trout outfitter up here in the mountains and that heron's poking holes into 10 pound trout that cost you three or $4 a pound to stock, I, I guess I could see it. But in a bass bluegill situation, you know, I, I don't really know that there's any need to, to really worry about turtles and wading birds. Jumping into weeds, the biggest thing that you want to do is identify that plant pest. You know, if, if you don't know what you're dealing with, there's no way to control it properly. And I, I really hate that. And this part of my job is one where you've got to time the application for the right time of year. You've got to know that, that pest to know exactly what weed you have. You want to assess the acreage and the water flow coming through the pond and the flow rates that you can select the right product or the right number of grass carp to control the situation. I don't know how many people have called me after spending $500, $1,000, that literally they, they might as well have set on fire. Just, just write the check and set it on fire. They're just wasting money by not getting the right information to start with. And if you don't have time to stop by and see us, there are some tools available. Aquaplant has a great website for plant identification. It gives you links to the herbicides that will be effective. It gives you recommendations for those herbicides, links to the labels and product safety information. Uh, a great site that I utilize a lot. You know, you definitely want to utilize us as well. Some of the things we might recommend are sometimes grass carp. You know, grass carp can only eat soft succulent weeds that are underneath the water surface. They're not going to do well on cattails or water lilies. They're not going to be able to eat water meal or duckweed, but there are certain situations where grass carp can be an effective preventative or a long-term solution to controlling vegetation problems. Chemicals sometimes are the only option and uh, you need to have an aquatic labeled product you want to select the right active ingredient to get an immediate impact. And you need to know, you know, is it going to take multiple applications? Should you divide that pond into quarters or thirds to make those treatments? How much of the pond is affected before you go to making that treatment? And then think about, you know, what is the pond used for? Is it for swimming, irrigation? Is it uh, just for fishing? You know, I once went to a golf course situation where, you know, they had just weed eated the edges down. And, and they hated it, but my recommendation on that particular weed was you've got to let that weed grow back up so that it'll have enough surface area for the herbicide to adhere to. And there were two to three options of, of herbicides available for that situation. And in their situation, two of the herbicide options would damage all those greens and fairways that they were irrigating out of that particular pond. And only one of the three products would be sufficient to control the problem without creating new problems. So make sure you know what's gonna happen. You know, here in my area, a lot of these ponds drain to trout streams where if we use a lot of copper to control algae, like in this picture, I could kill trout for miles downstream if I'm not careful. So it pays to know a little bit about the chemical that you're applying and why. Keep in mind that some chemicals are systemic, meaning they're gonna work really slow. And you might not like that. You may not see immediate results. And, and it really helps because the plant's going to absorb that herbicide, take it down to the root system of the plant, and it's going to work more effectively long term because it's killing the plant instead of your other option is a contact herbicide. And contact herbicides work well for, for single cell plants like algae, for example, because once it hits it and kills it, it's gone. The only thing I would worry about in terms of contact herbicides is that if you kill that algae and it breaks back down into nitrogen and phosphorus and, and nutrients, if conditions are right, that weed's just going to keep coming back. So we'll talk about how to control algae in just a little bit. There's lots of consultants in the state of Georgia. There's so many folks doing quality work. Uh, there's a whole list of them. You want to go online and see, are the folks you're talking to bonded and insured? Are they qualified? Do they have the proper education? Can they provide you quality references? Do they have proper equipment? And then local. I mean, there's so many consultants across the state of Georgia that when you look at that list, 
you've probably got two to three folks within an hour's range that can come give you a quote, you know, and sometimes their quotes may be high or low based on their availability. So it pays to get several quotes from folks nearby. Know that travel time and mileage is going to be tacked onto that fee. So I always like to, to encourage you to take care of the home folks and uh, look at that consultants list and, and check them out. There's a lot of folks there to help you if you need them. First step in long-term control of any weed problem is make sure that hardness and alkalinity is where it's supposed to be. Look at that watershed to slow any runoff, any fertilization that may be coming in from, from pastures or fields, any fertilization that could be coming from your yard. I don't know how many times I've been to really lush landscapes in neighborhoods and they, they want to blame other things for that weed problem other than themselves. But, you know, sometimes you may be the culprit. It could be overstocking, overfeeding, or fertilizing the pond improperly. Make sure you figure out what is the source and prevent it. Once you've got that figured out, you can go into control options. And we're going to take some time for the rest of the presentation to, to answer questions and to go into individual weeds. But the biggest thing I want to have you check out with this is that each one of these weeds have different control recommendations. You can see here, grass carp are not mentioned for algae because grass carp just really can't get their mouth on algae and they really just don't like eating that slime. So they're not gonna do you a lot of good. You can see copper is an option up here in the mountains. I may need to switch to the green clean type product, uh, sodium carbonate. Uh, Diquat may be an option as well for me up here. I've got to be careful in trout country treating with copper. Switching gears to another weed. This one's growing out of the water, so it's kind of tough for the grass carp to swim up out of the water and grab it. So you can see low preference for grass carp. And you've got uh, amazapir, triclopyr, you know, is excellent options. Bispirac is, a, is another option, trade win. And then you've got good control options. And I list all those options like that because a lot of times folks may bring in samples where they have two to three types of weeds. And you may say, well, two of the weeds, you know, habitat provides excellent control. And then this other weed needs only renovate. So, you know, I may choose renovate because it would kill all three instead of just two of the three. And you can choose a herbicide, you know, like that to help control situations. You know, looking at some other options, you see totally different different option there. You've got rodeo, uh, an aquatic label of glyphosate there. Habitat is still there, but you know, going back to that previous slide, you know, trade, win, and renovate aren't here on the excellent options. Aren't really on the options at all. So each one of these weeds has specific herbicides that are very effective, and that's where you really want to get into figuring out what you have. <clears throat> Karen Nitella, you see all of a sudden there is a grass carp recommendation. Uh, it's a, a, a type of algae, so you still got the copper there. Uh, and it gives you a situation where treating that pond, you know, a third of the pond every seven to 10 days is an excellent thing. Let's see, we've got a question. Uh, for those of us on fixed tongue income or just not much money to spend, how do you know of local groups where people meet and help each other out. You know, for, for pond stuff like that, it just depends on where you live. You know, for me, you know, you can call your local extension office to get control recommendations like these to teach you how to do it yourself. And that's kind of why we're going through these things to where hopefully if you're on a limited income or fixed income, you've got to make decisions that are going to save you the best, the most money, especially to, to get you what you need done to control situations in that pond. And that's where, you know, deciding on the herbicides based on price. If you know one is excellent, if you know when and how to put it out, you can save yourself time and money. And depending on where you're at, there's a lot of forums online. You know, I, I guess there's a couple of consultant buddies that have pages that share free information all the time as well. Uh, you can send me an email and I'll try to put you in touch depending on where you live to give you some options there. This little guy is a, one I wanted to include in the weeds before we jump into all questions is a uh, water shield is one. You see that little jelly on the stem of the weed? 
that's one where it's really, really difficult for a herbicide to penetrate and kill this weed. And if you use a contact herbicide or if you overdo the application rate on the, the proper herbicide, you can burn those leaves off and the, the weeds got a, a nice little tuber down in the pond mud and uh, really gonna give you trouble in terms of control. So it's one where you've got to get out on a nice calm day. You've got to mix that herbicide appropriately and, you know, for example, the 2,4-D or the Habitat, if you sprayed those, it's not going to look like they work right away. It's going to take six to eight weeks for that herbicide to really start working and take action and do its thing. And uh, you're not going to get the immediate results you might be looking for. But uh, it's a weed that, that presents a lot of trouble. And a lot of folks would call that a water lily, whereas you can see in the guy's hand, you know, water lilies to me are a lot larger. There's a white water lily, there's lotus, there's spatter dock, and that goes back into proper identification of these weeds for the right control recommendation. Picture in the top right here is a, a homeowner's pond in Demarest where she had no idea where this weed came from. And when you looked up on the side of the house, she had a goldfish pond and there was a little bit of parrot's feather a little bit of water lily and a little bit of duckweed. And, and I said, well, there's duckweed in your, in your water garden. Can you tell me about that? And she said, oh, yeah, the pet store sells me that to feed my fish. My, my koi love to eat it. And uh, turns out whenever the pot, little water garden got a little too much, she would clean it out and toss it out. And, and lo and behold, it made it down the hill into her two-acre pond. And uh, she created this problem for herself. And you can see... Duckweed is one where if you're not really good at spraying and applying, you know, applying herbicides and keeping a good attention to detail, you're going to have a headache for, for years to come. So you've got some systemic options, you've got some contact options, but, you know, duckweed is definitely an example of one where you might want to hire somebody to help you take care of that. Watermill is the same way. You can see the duckweed leaves on my finger tied in with with little tiny water meal and uh, definitely one of the most difficult weeds to control. And it all goes back into getting that weed properly identified. I don't know how many people have been treating algae with diquat and copper for, for weeks or months on end and racking up six, eight thousand, you know, six, eight hundred dollar, a thousand dollar bill on chemicals, only to realize that this is water meal and not algae. You know, it pays to to get the weed properly identified. And like I said, you can see each one of those weeds, you know, you've got, you know, clipper being excellent. You've got uh, stingray, sonar, clipper, and galleon being excellent. Then you switch over here and you've got navigate and habitat. Each one of these weeds has different options and that's what we want to think about. So we've got a lot of slides on weeds that we can share. I was asked to try to keep this thing wrapped up by about 11.30 and uh, then start taking questions. So we're gonna do that. One thing I will mention before I run out of my hour hours allotted is that it's important to me that you take kids fishing. And that's why I created that Southeastern Youth Kayak Fishing Platform. A lot of times we'll have opportunities where kids can fish in a private pond. You know, a lot of it is on public water via canoe and kayak or wading or fishing from the bank. But that doesn't mean that you can't encourage, you know, maybe your 4-H office to host a kids fishing event this spring, or if you own a pond, how about offering to allow kids to come fish in that pond or just neighborhood kids, anything to get a kid excited about fishing like little Ian Shaw here in this picture. You know, for our platform, we've given away about $8,000 worth of prizes every year. You know, if you got newer used gear, we'd be glad to accept it and uh, give it away to anybody that wants to, to participate. And for me, you know, I'm always here to take questions, you know, talking about if you wanted a, the, a copy of the PowerPoint or the slides or maybe a recorded session like this that you could watch at a later time. We've got those. Happy to plug you in with your local county agent or, or a consultant nearby. Happy to come out and check out the pond. And, and the fish in the picture is a shoal bass here that we've been doing research on up in the upper Chattahoochee and uh, doing some tagging and genetics work. And, and that leaves me with one more thought that I always like to share on any of these presentations with a lot of the DNR guys fighting their best to protect our native fisheries is try not to move fish. You know, 
if you've got a pond, you don't need smallmouth bass. You don't need spotted bass. You don't need to, to take some shoal bass over to a new creek where they've never been caught before. Let those fish stay where they're supposed to be. We've got so many tremendous troubles all across our state with uh, protecting our native black bass species that uh, just wanted to throw in a plug there so that uh, we could protect fish like you see in this picture. It's a shoal bass up on the upper Chattahoochee. Only river in the world where they occur naturally is right on the, the Chattahoochee Apalachicola Flint drainage. They're introduced to the Elk Mogie, but uh, keep fish where they're supposed to be and uh, send us any questions you may have. I guess Brent saying good info. If you've got any questions, I, I hit my 1130 mark. I know Travis was a little worried when he saw 120 or 100 slides, how we'd get through all these, but uh, glad to take questions and we're right on time. So I'm here as long as y'all want to ask questions, you know, we can, we can stick around. Thanks, Stephen. I did see, I'm not sure if you got the first question in the chat. What is the minimum pond depth and size to support fisheries? Yeah, we talked about that one initially. I mean, the, the pond size really goes back to your goals. I mean, I've, I guess my wife's grandparents had a pond that was maybe the size of a swimming pool and I could take Dylan over there and catch a, an eight pound, a, a five pound and a three pound largemouth anytime you wanted to go on a Sunday and uh, we'd catch little horny heads out of the creek and free line them for those fish. And he could catch three or four fish and have the time of his life. And, and then we'd head back home, just take about an hour. So, you know, managing that fish population appropriately is, is the key to, you know, figuring out what you can do with what you've got. Let's see, we've got to understand that all weeds are different, but those that may have beneficial qualities Well, you know, on that one, it really goes into your, your personal preference on the, you know, whether a weed is bad or not. You know, going back to that water, sheet, water shield slide, let me see if I can find, you know, this water shield, I had a buddy that owned, they did mining for coal. And when they filled up the lakes, he had a 35 acre lake that was covered in water shield. And we would take about a gallon of chemical you know, that's about all we wanted to spend money on and spray out little pockets and holes in prime areas where we knew we wanted to fish and be able to get to. And we just let that water shield take over the rest of the lake so that we could, you know, we could really figure out, you know, where we wanted to, to put that control thing. So it's really up to you, you know, whether a weed, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. It could be a good thing to have water lilies. You know, people want to plant things. Just make sure if you introduce a weed, that you've got the proper depth where it won't take over the whole pond. If you've got a shallow pond, you've got to know that you're going to have to keep some of that reined in and under control. So uh, that's really the question for me is, you know, what is that weed going to do for you? You know, what, what's going to happen if you don't take care of it? I guess questions are jumping all around. Let's see. Contents of fish food, you know, sources to purchase fish food, you know, the, the local feed store, you know, your, your feed store, if they don't have it, you can talk to them about products. You can talk to give different consultants about delivering products. If you're nearby one of our local consultants, I know several of them sell feed. And really when you're looking into feed, you're trying to figure out, you know, what are you feeding? Are you feeding hybrid striped bass and trout where, you know, a lot of that could be fish meal based to get that protein content really high. You know, the, the Aquamax feeds, for example, you know, some of those things, when you look at the first ingredient, it's fish meal versus other types of fish food. You might have a grain base and uh, that may be fine for catfish and other things. But, you know, you really want to dictate, you know, what, you know, what are you feeding dictates what kind of money you're going to spend on that fish food. The slides, uh, I think I've got them still posted on my website. I'll, I'll probably go back in and change it out on our website and add this presentation just to keep the most up to date when there. I usually try to drop a recording of the most recent presentation on my website. And I know Maria said she was going to have them on the website for the webinars as well. So, you know, we'll probably be able to, to post it up. You know, if you, if you want to send me an email or maybe check, 
I, I maintain a Facebook page where you could look for a link there as well. We can we can get you a copy of the slides anytime. You know, good resource for native buffer zone plan options. That's going to go back into, you know, really. I tend to like, you know, a lot of variety. And depending on the native buffer zone, you know, you're going to look at that habitat and decide, you know, is it something where Virginia sweet spire, is it going to stay soggy where you might want something like Virginia sweet spire is a bush that would grow in with wet feet? Is it something where it's going to stay dry where you could plant, you know, ornamental plants that are going to stay, you know, creep and change, you know, it, it really gets into the biggest thing that I like is, is woody plant material to hold that soil in place. You know, I try to stay away from just grass, but uh, there's a lot of information out there for pollinator gardening that Extension has to offer where really you're just looking for a low maintenance, you know, low fertilizer application type of plant material. And that could be your personal preference, whether it's irises, whether it's daylilies, whether it's, you know, fescue lawn, whether it's viburnums and hydrangeas and shrubs and trees, you know, really the buffer zone plants are up to you. Uh, reclaiming an old uncared pond. What are your thoughts on natural muck reducer, muck away? You know, you really get into a situation where if the pond is that filled in, you may need to dig and dredge it out. You know, it, reclaiming an old uncared for pond, it really depends on, you know, say for example, my mom and daddy's pond was about 50 years old. The upper end has a lot of sediment, has a lot of, uh, leaf litter and whatnot and, and we've never cleaned it out you know we did lime the pond and you know we may have maybe 10 percent of that upper end is silted in where it's really shallow and you can't get the boat there but you know 35 years later 40 years later after living there that long the pond is still there and things are still fine it, it really goes into is that uncared silted in muck creating weed problems and creating water quality problems or is it just that the pond's getting shallower and shallower every year? That's going to be a, you know, site evaluation. We'd have to look at it and see what it is. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the muck reducers and muck away things. I would really get in and try to find a way to get a, a backhoe or something like a dredge to get that material out. If you have a 15 acre lake with filamentous algae, I would really look at what's fueling it. Is it fertilizer? Is it, you know, feeding? Is it, if it's coming in from runoff from upstream and it's something that you can't control, you may have to get on a routine where you're using chemicals to, to knock it back at key times of the year. You know, I know, for example, up here, I, I help manage a really large lake that's 125 acres. And when you look at the, the watershed of the lake, that neighborhood controls probably 80% of the watershed. So it's going back in and talking to all the landowners in the watershed to say, hey, could you just use buffers around the ditches? Could you apply fertilizer at the right time of year? Could you try to do a better job at controlling that nitrogen and phosphorus that's flowing into my lake because it's causing me problems? And they may tell you to, to stick a sock in it. They don't want to hear that. And, but they may be agreeable to where, you know, they're going to do something to help you out. And that, that would be my goal is to, to track back and you can, you can go online and find topo maps or go to your NRCS office or your extension office and map out that watershed to where you should be able to figure out where your problems are coming from to eliminate as many nutrients as possible. Russ says he's stocking catfish and bluegill into a third acre pond every year and every year they get eaten by otters, minks, and herons. You know, the, the otters are one that's probably cleaning those fish out. You know, if you're stocking them heavy, you know, you may have to lower that stocking rate and you may have to keep, you know, active on the trapping. You may have to keep active with the, the scope and the rifle to try to figure out how to, how to keep those otters at bay because the herons really shouldn't do that big a deal. You know, mink, I don't know that I would be too worried or concerned thinking they were a big issue, but otters... I would definitely keep an eye on and you do have to make sure to touch base with the DNR crowd because otters are going to be protected and you do have seasons and things like that for trapping and there are licensed trappers out there that you know may be interested but you know otters are going to be the thing that's going to clean those fish out faster than anything and it really happens during the winter months 
you know, that's something where for catfish, for example, I know you can you can stock a little bit larger catfish in the spring. If that's something where you got fewer, bigger fish in the spring, it may be a little harder for those otter to get it in, you know, grab and touch. The bluegill, you wouldn't think that they could they could eat those. So, you know, the bluegill should be spawning and reproducing and being self-sustaining. You shouldn't have to worry about restocking those from time to time. So I was just assigned in our association, our retention pond management, and I'm starting to learn. How many times a year should we have our ponds checked? You know, typically, you know, if, if, if it's in a neighborhood association or something like that, I would, you know, I would have somebody check it out at least, you know, at least once every couple of weeks, once a month during the season to see when and if weed problems pop up and, uh, that way you can get them in check before they start taking over the pond or causing lots of trouble. Uh, really water quality, you might test once a year, you know, just to keep an eye to have some baseline data, but uh, really things aren't going to happen too fast in a pond to get out of whack and get to cause lots of trouble. Unless you've got situations, like we said, where, you know, someone's purposely intentionally overstocking, overfeeding, over fertilizing, that's the kind of things you want to keep an eye on more than the pond itself. You can take a soil sample from the bottom of the pond when you're building the pond. You know, once it's actually filled up with water, most folks just test the water quality to try to figure out, you know, exactly what you need to do in terms of liming. You know, you can test the soil before you fill the pond, but, you know, like we said, usually you're testing water afterwards. My pond doesn't have an overflow drain. Is that normal? You know, really depends on the flow. You know, somebody might have just dug a hole if you're if you're farther south where the water table is a lot higher and it's just a, a wet spot that stays full based on groundwater. You know, you may not have any water flowing in and out to where a drain is going to be needed. It may be flat ground where a drain's not necessarily needed, but you know, if you feel like when it rains, the water starts coming over the dam or part of the dam, you might look into installing an emergency spillway initially. You might look into installing a, a small siphon drain. It's pretty easy to construct, especially on a small pond like that to where you know you have something functioning. It shouldn't take a lot to do that. Ruben wants a copy of the work. We've got some more good programs. Regarding mucking out the pond, please have them reach out to EPD or local permitting office before mucking out a pond. Most ponds are buffered state waters and are protected. And, uh, you know, that's one where, you know, there are there are folks there that you can reach out to for that information. Like Tracy's saying, uh, never hurts to know, you know, what's there, you know, for us. We get a lot of concerns and questions about stuff like that because it's tied to the, the water gets muddy on our creeks and folks get upset because it's trout water. So definitely doesn't hurt to reach out to, you know, your local erosion and soil man in the county level. We'll have those contacts with EPD. And uh, that's definitely a good point Tracy's making there. In your slides for posting, can you provide some pictures of skin lesions indicative of problems with fish's health? I've noticed one of the last picture of this slide program that's thanks the information is great you know when you think about you know lesions when i get pictures of fish diseases from folks you know a lot of times it's it's always interesting sometimes you can almost see a handprint or if you imagine someone grabbing that fish and handling it in a fish disease situation where you know where are those lesions going to come up they're going to come up around the gills around the mouth where someone was trying to get a hook out around the the back behind the pectoral spines on the catfish where you're holding to keep from getting can uh getting stuck by the catfish that's definitely something there you know there are a couple of good publications online we can send you to that give you lots of information about fish diseases that may be a little better than worrying about my slides jumping right into somebody that uh does something does that for a living i do see the otters pulling in early summer pulling fish uh, you know, otters should be there active in the winter time as well. You know, I'd, I'd really be really looking right now because in the winter time when water temperatures get cold, 
that's when you really start to see the, the catfish wad up in a school and they're moving slow. That's when the otters do their most damage is in the cold weather months. So I would, I would keep an eye out right now for them. And uh, MPDS permits, that all goes back into, you know, like Tracy's saying, anytime you're getting into a buffer or anything that could be considered state waters, you know, it doesn't hurt to touch base with your county erosion and sediment guy. You know, my fella here is is always helpful. You know, he's he's always there to to come out and give you your options and give you the information you need to stay stay out of trouble. And uh, definitely not a watchdog looking to get anybody in trouble. And I don't think you know our our EPD folks that are coming out are as well. We just need to be cognizant that you know other folks do feel like environmental protection is important, and that's a lot of times where the whistleblower calls come from. And if you've already touched base to say, hey, I'm going to work on my pond, give me some suggestions, show me where to go. When they call to, to turn you in for doing something they feel like you're not supposed to, you've already done the homework, you've already got the approvals, and everybody knows what's happening. And it's not a big deal anymore because you've, you've done everything you're supposed to do. Grubs and the fish kind of come and go. You know, that's something where if you've got a pond that has grubs, if you're catching fish and you know they're there, it may, it may not hurt to remove them. I don't know that there's any treatments you can apply to the lake. There may be other folks listening into this, this thing that can, can give suggestions, but, you know, typically if you get a, you know, dense population, heavy population, you know, you're getting close to that carrying capacity, you're exceeding it, and you start seeing grubs in the fish, it may not hurt to, to try to remove the fish that you know have them just to try to lower that vector, but I, I don't know of any any treatments for the, the actual pond itself that would get rid of them. I know a lot of folks ask the same thing about leeches from time to time, and, you know, there's, there's some folks that feel like maybe they want to treat with copper to kill the leeches, for example, but to get those concentrations high enough to eliminate them, you just about eliminate all the fish in the pond as well. So, you know, you're, you usually don't have a lot of lot of options there. It, it's just something you have to deal with. We're doing tagging floats this year. That's that's something we're going to hopefully kick off, Andy. I, I'm looking to do the chest of tea. You know, that's something that for the tagging study, we're not going to tag on the chest of tea. So you won't be looking for tag fish on the chest of tea. You'll just be, we'll be looking to collect fin clips. And what we're talking about doing for the folks that aren't in the know is we're collecting genetics information on those native black bass species. For example, Andy's wondering last night or night before last about a Chattahoochee bass he caught last season. And unfortunately for the Chattahoochee bass, most of those fish on our upper Chattahoochee are experiencing a lot of integration by, you know, Alabama bass being present. So, you know, we're trying to catalog where are pure Chattahoochee bass, where do they exist, how do we protect them? You know, Bryant Bowen and Hunter Roop are the biologists that are on top of that project with us that are that are doing that work through the Department of Natural Resources. And we're looking forward to to tagging this year. Probably going to get started in the summertime months just to make sure our catch rates are high. You know, I I do got a little Carolina skiff. I was going to try to run up from Lumpkin Park and and try pecking around for winter schooling fish. I just hadn't hadn't had a chance to do that quite yet. You know, if you want to, you want to figure out where you're at in terms of state waters, you know, that all you've got to do there is uh, check out with your local erosion and sediment guy and just talk to him about your situation and your pond and, and see what he says. You know, like I said, my guy here would, would tell you what your options are for, for doing things and, and how to stay out of trouble, how to keep from, from violating any regulations. And if you needed to get into the buffer, like for example, up here, you know, we're talking about primary and secondary trout water for my county. So all you've got to do is let them know. And if you do need a buffer variance, there are, you know, options there. I know Dr. Shelton is, is working with me on putting together a guide for these type of questions on streams and ponds and lakes about, you know, buffer variances. And if you want to do some, some work in the buffer to enhance it or improve it or repair situations and problems, you'll know how to stay out of trouble. That's something that we, we're definitely trying to put together, you know, over the next few months and, and see if we can get something for folks across the state to use. But uh, definitely a question where 
being proactive and, and asking the questions up front can save you some time and money in, in the instance of somebody trying to, to give you a fine. Uh, anytime you've got questions about fishery stuff, you know, don't be afraid to call your county agent and they can get in touch with myself or Dr. Shelton or Dr. Bertle. And uh, we'll be glad to answer those questions. And and I, I always enjoy just coming out to visit sometimes if it's nearby and I can come see it. It's a, it's a lot of fun to get out and, and walk the pond bank and help you reach your goals and have you send me pictures of big fish someday. Great job, Stephen. I appreciate you sharing all of your um, expertise and knowledge with us. I certainly learned a lot and we appreciate everyone tuning in. All righty.